six years since I left Tibet as a refugee for freedom in India have been hard for Tibetans, including myself. One instruction from our tradition has helped sustain us is to try to transform even the most adverse circumstances into opportunities. In my own case, life as a refugee has broadened my horizons. If I had remained in Tibet, I would most likely have been insulated from the outside world, shut off from the challenge of different points of view. As it is, I have been fortunate to have been able to travel to many different countries, to meet many, many different people, <laughs> to learn from their experiences and share some of my own with them. This suited my own temperament that dislikes formality, which only serves to create distance between people. I do love Dalai Lama in that sense that, you know, the Dalai Lama in a ritual, like an initiation ritual, he can be very ceremonious and very, you know, sort of majestic with his gestures and sort of booming voice and this kind of thing. And then when you meet him in the corridor or whatever, he's like totally Mr. Normal. And he kids around and he shakes hands with the gardener as well as the owner of the house and the security guy as well as the president and whatever. When he visited the first White House where we got him to go see the old Bush, Bush one, when he left, Millie left with him, the dog. The dog came around in the elevator and went and they didn't realize it. And then he, they were going across the lawn and the dog was frolicking along next to him. And the security people had to chase the dog <laughs> to get her to go back to the family. Anyway, so that's, he's, and he has what I call resilience or flexibility of identity. He's not always rigidly the big guru, you know. And he doesn't really like to have horns blown and people jump up and down when he goes somewhere, you know, to announce his arrival like some great marvelous thing. He doesn't like that. So he doesn't do it. As a human being, I acknowledge that my well-being depends on others, and caring for others' well-being is a moral responsibility I take seriously. It's unrealistic to think that the future of humanity can be achieved on the basis of prayer or good wishes alone. What we need is to take action. Therefore, my first commitment is to contribute to human happiness as best I can. I am also a Buddhist monk, so that's now uh, my son, uh, Gandan, who is uh, in charge here, uh, he said that I had to explain to some people what I mean by saying this is a teacher's training course. And um, I did that, and I, there's an addendum that will be mentioned on the website. But uh, really, this is all I mean, is that you know a lot of you are familiar faces. You've come to many of my talks. Some of you may be brand new, I realize. But Especially, I'm sort of tired of introducing everything to everybody. And, you know, I used to, in academia, train graduate students to teach Buddhism academically, which is a little different from teaching it to a practitioner or teaching it to someone who wants to integrate it in their life in the formality of it. Although, actually, students do integrate things in their life, and actually, they should be more encouraged to explore different things and look at them. But, unfortunately, in the corporate university nowadays, they are not. So in a way, in an academic setting, you, you teach about Buddhism. You give like a taste of it, you know, in an about way. Uh, and, um, you know, and therefore, actually, they have a prejudice, actually, in graduate uh, settings that students who teach it shouldn't like it that much, you know, who become teachers. In other words, you can't be a good teacher if you like it, your subject. You know, and supposedly Christians or materialists, you know, are supposed to be, able to be objective about something they teach. But if you're a Buddhist, you can't be objective because you must love Buddhism. So therefore, you know, there was, I, I ran into things in, during my almost 40 plus years of teaching, some obstacles about the fact that how can you be an academic teacher when you like Buddhism? And you even teach Buddhism in a Buddhist setting, like to people who are already trying to be Buddhist or practice that. Although in, the, in, in our culture, we have Jubus and we have we, don't have, we have lots of Chris Boos, but they don't call themselves Chris Boos because they're not as clever as the Jew Boos, probably. <laughs> or they're more annoyed with Christianity. And there should be Mus Boos. There's a few Mus Boos here and there, you know, Muslim Buddhists. And there's a bunch of, what would you call them? Nibus, nihilistic Buddhists. 
that is secular, or sect Buddhist, maybe secular Buddhist. And recently I discovered a person who was a shamanist, you know, like a, a shaman into a indigenous tradition. So we decided she was a shambu. <laughs> so, so anyway, by teacher's training, I just mean that I want to offer a course of things where someone then is going to be capable of explaining as a virtue friend, as a Kalyana Mitra to others, and confidently explain the Buddha Dharma to them. And now some people, if they take the courses, this one in the coming years, if they're psychologists or they're health professionals or something, and they want what are called CEUs and CMUs and all this kind of thing, then they can arrange that. We have a way of arranging that. But I don't certify that except that I'm a, qualified to teach. And a friend of mine from San Francisco has a way of helping us certify that. So that's different. The only thing you'll get as a teacher from me is a certificate after you pass a test after a long time. And uh, then, then you'll get a Tibet house certificate. But I mean, these yoga people who do teacher training, what do they do? They don't go and get something from the State Department you know, or the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. They just give a, a Richard Freeman certificate, that's all. And they, people can get a job in a yoga center. Now, in the, what center can there's a, such a certificate help someone? Well, it helps you in life. And hopefully, if the force for good catches on the way Dan Goldman is showing his holiness wants it to, there's a lot of opportunities to teach which are not in religious settings, in schools, in, in other places, you know, where these things are done anyway. Because what one is doing is, as he said, contribute to human happiness as best one can. That's the basic thing, okay? And now, continuing with Dalai Lama's words, I am also a Buddhist monk, and according to my experience, all religious traditions have the potential to convey the message of love and compassion. So right then and there, he makes his, uh, his commitment not to be trying to convert anyone to Buddhism, which I share, and which this, this not being a Dharma center, we're not asking people to become Buddhists in any way. This is a cultural center. We are asking people to take interest in and to try to help preserve the culture of Tibet, which is in danger. So by saying that, he's saying you can get there by all the paths. You know? And he doesn't mention secularism here. But he also tries and later in other works to indicate that a, sec a good secular humanist can get there. But he doesn't include them here, which I like because I don't agree completely with that idea. I think secularism is a little bit too imprisoning to some people. And I'll explain why eventually. So my second commitment is to foster harmony and friendly relations between world religions. Thirdly, I am a Tibetan. And although I have retired from political responsibility, I remain concerned to do what I can to help the Tibetan people and to preserve our Buddhist culture and the natural environment of Tibet, both of which are under threat of destruction. And that's what this place is, this Tibet house. It's a place that was designed and His Holiness has kept going. And even when sometimes we were tired of doing it and wanted to turn it back to some other people to manage perhaps, he's insisted that we continue. Uh, and, it, and it is his cultural center so far in America his own. I am very happy to see that my old friend Dan Goldman has written this book, exploring and describing how these basic commitments have unfolded over the past several decades. An experienced writer and someone with an active interest in the science of our inner and outer worlds, he has been very, that's very important, in the science of our inner and outer worlds, he has been very helpful to me and is well qualified to express these things clearly as he has done here. The goal of happier human beings living together and supporting each other more fully in a more peaceful world is, I believe, something we can achieve, which might surprise some of us reading the Daily News, <laughs> uh, actually, that it's something achievable. He believes that still. But we have to look at it taking a broad view and a long-term perspective. Change in ourselves and in the world in which we live may not take place in a hurry. It will take time. But if we don't make the effort, nothing will happen at all. The most important thing I hope readers will come to understand is that such change will not take place because of decisions taken by governments or at the UN. Real change will take place when individuals transform themselves, guided by the values that lie at the core of all human ethical systems, scientific findings, 
and common sense. While reading this book, please keep in mind that as human beings, equipped with marvelous intelligence and the potential for developing a warm heart, each and every one of us can become a force for good. <laughs> it's really nice, isn't it? So I wanted to start with that, which His Holiness. Now, in the book itself, uh, Dan quotes His Holiness all over the place. And actually, Dan is going to come to one of these classes in the 17 classes. He keeps telling me, but he keeps not giving me a date. But hopefully, he will give a date. I was, uh, we wanted to give him an award for doing this pro bono for His Holiness. And he even can't make the date where he gets the award. So he may have to wait a year. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. OK. So any questions about anything about the course? Does anybody have? Anybody have a question? No? Now, one thing that I promised in this course is that I will take time for questions. So if you don't have questions on that topic, I will begin the main topic of the day. But I will stop in about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have questions. So think of, as I talk, think of what questions you might, you might bring up. Or do you have a question? You like you almost have a question. You're like inhaling there. And are you? Do you have one? No. No, no. The lady behind you, Laura. Okay. So you know the first what we're talking today, just like when I teach other courses about Buddhism, where one always starts is one starts about the Buddha. You know, about uh, the life of the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. You know, our Buddha who, in Mahayana Buddhist perspective, is still here. He, you know, and actually, it's so amazing. I've been studying Buddhism now for 50 years. And only recently, I suddenly realized that all these years, I have been repeating a mistaken translation that you read everywhere when you read about Buddhism, where, particularly coming out of the Pali tradition, actually, uh, where you, but also followed by people who are working on the Sanskrit tradition, the expression pari nirvana, you know, uh, in other words, which is always translated as final nirvana, because it connects with the so-called the death of the Buddha, right? But pari doesn't mean final. There are Sanskrit words for final, and pari doesn't mean that. And I didn't even notice it. It's something I so much took for granted. Pari means total, or thorough. And what total nirvana could mean, in addition to Buddha, that being Buddha marking that, is Buddha finding nirvana or spreading nirvana or exemplifying the spread of nirvana in the infinite. That is to say, the whole world being nirvana, rather than it being final nirvana with nirvana assumed to be a Buddha departing from the world. It's Buddha embracing the world totally and finally as nirvana which the Buddha taught is the true nature of the world. This, and this is, of course, the setting of this, this course and the, this teaching, and the Buddha's teaching, which is an immediate different view than is shared by all kinds of other teachings, which is that the default reality, you know, when, if you drop out of all else, if you die, if you let go, if you become unconscious, whatever it is, what happens is, you are buoyed, you are embraced in nirvana. Because the actual nature of the world is nirvana. So what that means is you, you are, we are all in nirvana already. I know this one Christian preacher who blew my mind once, the one time I visited his church, which he invited me to do to give a, a part of the sermon to promote a book I wrote called Infinite Life. No, no, it was Why the Dalai Lama Matters book. And uh, he gave a sermon called, All Right Already. Because he's, like, you know, he, he's making, meeting sort of common language with his high Christian idea. And all right already means it's already all right. From the beginning, it always has been all right. <laughs> and Buddha, and I was, it blew my mind because I was about to give a similar talk about how nirvana if it is ultimate reality as Buddha proclaimed it to be and discovered it to be and proclaimed it to be, it has to have always been the case because it's something uncreated, unmade, un indivisible, you know, eternal, etc. So it has to have been always everything. 
And these people running around who think they're separate from everything else and it's overwhelming to them and they're suffering and having problems, the ignorance is precisely the ignorance of that misperception of what is nirvana. And therefore, nirvana doesn't mean that everybody is eradicated. It means everybody, as they are, is living nirvana. If they knew it. They don't know it, so they think they're living some sort of a mess. So the whole project is not to find a different place, which would just be another relative place, even if it, if, which was not this place. The whole project is to discover the true nature of this place. And that means as you are, actually. But with wisdom, replacing ignorance is the difference. Wisdom meaning knowledge of the nature of reality. OK? I'm jumping ahead there. But I'm setting up that context, if you follow me. Because that's the context of the, Buddha, the Buddha's life, actually. OK? Now I'm turning to a story of the life of the Buddha some excerpts that I translated from an 18th century Tibetan Lama called Yongzin Sechong Ling, Yishi Gelsen. And I like this beginning, kind of. And he says, <clears throat> for a Buddha to visit Earth is as extremely rare as for an Udumvara flower to bloom from Earth to heaven. Now, an Udumvara flower is a mythic flower, we would say. Its roots are in the earth, but even going down beneath the earth to hell. So its roots are in hell. The stalk goes right up through all of the worlds of desire and the worlds of pure matter, and finally to the immaterial realm, or actually at the boundary between the realm of pure matter, top of that realm, and the immaterial realm, sort of on the infinity horizon of that space, where the bloom blossoms. It's a mythic thing. And then the one who sees the bloom is Brahma, who is the most powerful of the gods and is thought by most people in India in Buddha's time to be the creator, because they had theistic, you know, monotheistic traditions, and he was thought to be the creator. He does reveal, though, in a Buddha Sutra, which we will read, <laughs> that he didn't really do it. <laughs> when someone asked him, they say, well, how did you do it? Like, what was it before you created it, and where was it, and what was happening? And then after some hemming and hawing, for reasons we'll explain when we read that, he said, well, you know, the secret is I didn't really do it. Therefore, he said, go ask Buddha how it works, you know, and he'll tell you, this monk who asked him in this Buddha Sutta. And he said, and also, please ask Buddha to tell people that when th horrible things happen to them, I didn't create them. Because if it's an omnipotent creator who created everything, then you can't get out of the idea that all the bad things came also from the same source, since it supposedly created everything. And Brahma wanted people to know that he didn't make the bad things that caused them to suffer. So he said, have Buddha tell them that, please. And this is an actual sutra from thousands of years ago. And it's kind of humorous also. But we'll read it. We'll read it. So I'll go back to it. But anyway, Brahma then takes the, ex the elixir or the essence of that flower and puts it in a little some kind of divine jewel substance that he, he can shape, because he can shape reality to some extent. And then he carries it and he gives it to the Buddha when a, when a Buddha is conceived in the, in magically in the womb of Lady Maya. You know, Lady Magic, that means Maya means magic. Why? Why is it be, for a Buddha to visit Earth as extremely rare as for an Udumvara flower to bloom from Earth to heaven? Why? To become a Buddha in the world, one must conceive the supreme spirit of enlightenment and accumulate massive stores of merit and knowledge for an immeasurably long time over three incalculable aeons of lifetimes. Innumerable relativities must be arranged, such as purifying the Buddhaverse, that's the universe as understood by an enlightened being, fulfilling the vows, and developing the continua of the disciples. It is the evolutionary continua of people. It is very difficult to arrange so many relativities. Therefore, this world is usually sunken in ages of darkness, and the illuminated aeon of a Buddha's advent is barely a possibility. It is very hard for beings caught in this world's life cycle to develop even a tiny virtuous mind. Whatever virtue they do develop relies only on the Buddha's power. 
if it is so very rare to have a tiny good feeling such as faith in the Buddha? Why mention how rare it is for one to develop ethical discernment about evolutionary actions through finding faith in the three jewels, which means Buddha, the teaching and the reality taught, and the community trying to live by that? Or to be moved by transcendent renunciation to abandon longing for mundane successes and learn the path of liberation? If it is so very rare to be moved by transcendence to learn the path of liberation, why mention how rare it is to be moved by the precious spirit of enlightenment that cherishes others over self to learn and constantly practice for many incalculable aeons, the ocean of bodhisattva deeds? How did our compassionate teacher first conceive the spirit of enlightenment himself? Innumerable aeons ago, when he happened to be born as a bull, in one of the hells, pulling a cart in a team, he felt compassion for a weaker fellow bull. He told the Yama demon, Yama is the Lord of Death in the Buddhist, uh, the judge of the dead, the Lord of Death in Hindu and also Buddhist thing, the Yama demon Alang, that he would pull the load alone to not stop whipping the fellow bull. Alang was so angry with this moment of compassion, he killed that Buddha bull with his trident and the Bodhisattva was born at once in the 33 heaven. That's the heaven, to, heaven of Indra. I'm going to change this because it's too hot now. It's very warm. My sweater is too warm. Sorry, folks at home. So, you know, they're going back to like way back when Buddha started being a bodhisattva. Does everyone know the expression bodhisattva? Bodhisattva means a hero of enlightenment. Bodhi means enlightenment, and sattva means a hero. Uh, usually, it can also mean something else in other contexts. So, so that's just a sort of Tibetan vision of the Buddha beginning, and there's a lot of great stories in that account. But let me tell it like, um, like in my own words, the Buddha's life is illustrating something about what we're doing today and what Tibet is about, which this connects to. And that is Buddha was born, and of course there, it's like there's, there's an extreme way of seeing Buddha as just an emanation, what they call a nirmanakaya, a magical emanation uh, of someone who already was a Buddha, but who emanated as a human being in the sort of top of the most developed society in Eurasia in the, on the planet at that time which was in India, and then showed the path to people to give example of what you have to do to try to transform yourself and to reach the evolutionary stage of enlightenment of a Buddha where you simultaneously feel you're infinite and all beings. At the same time, you can manifest like separated entities to interact with beings, not just one, actually. You can manifest many bodies. So there's one view where this Buddha was where Shakyamuni Buddha, who was born as Siddhartha, chose a certain family, chose a mother and father, you know, landed in a certain place at a certain time in history, performed these various deeds, actually chose to be reborn without knowing exactly who he was, with just an intuition, so that he genuinely did have to unfold his ignorance, to you know, was re-embody like with ignorance, actually. And there are emanations, you know, they have this thing of uh, Tibetan thing where they have what they call tulkus, you know, these so-called Rinpoches. Well, the, being a Rinpoche means you're a Nirmanakaya, so an emanation of a Buddha, supposedly. But you might be one where a Buddha emanated as an ignorant person. <laughs> so that might explain why sometimes tulkus misbehave, which they do actually, sometimes. Maybe they haven't recovered their full Buddha knowledge. You know. But they're supposed to, that's what they're supposed to do. And they voluntarily decide to be reborn without their knowledge. But, but with an intuition enabling them perhaps to regain it, something like that. And then there are those Buddhists who see the Buddha as really just an ordinary person who was ignorant and so forth, and he was a prince, and he was a spoiled brat, kind of, but he was very smart. And then he eventually like, broke away and he, he became a Buddha. He became enlightened, which is not really much different from any of his students who became enlightened themselves by studying what he taught. And they don't really necessarily explain why he was able to make such a great effect as a teacher, while the others were not necessarily able to do that. So they don't really get into that issue of the difference. 
And when you talk to those people and debate them about how come Buddha was so remarkable, what was the, they just say he was luckier. <laughs> he had some good luck. So there's a whole gamut of views about a Buddha's life. But the Mahayana tends toward being aware of the sort of, uh, you can sort of say divine, but it isn't really divine because it's, he's never presented as a creator of any kind. Buddha doesn't create the world. In fact, Buddha finds solace in the uncreated reality of the world. And he helps people deconstruct a world of suffering, actually. So he uncreates a world of suffering and brings people back to the actual world, which is a world of bliss. He eventually reveals it to be. And actually, right away, once he's enlightened, he reveals it to be. So anyway, whether it's sort of a divine show, you know, the, the Mahayana version of Buddha's biography is called Lalita Vistara, which means something like the greatest show on earth, like P.T. Barnum. It actually means that. Lalita means a play. And it can mean a play like playful. And it can mean a play like a drama. And Vistara means magnificent or expansive. So a magnificent play or a magnificent show. I like to say greatest show on earth. And actually, it's been my life mo motivation or wish, which perhaps another life I'll get to do, is to make a film of it. You know? Super Buddha, you know, something like that. You know? And I've been discouraged that you know, nobody likes Superman, so you can't make a film where somebody's already very enlightened or something. Never mind. That's my personal complaint. <laughs> it is a marvelous show, though. Anyway, he gets reborn, and he doesn't. Have, his mother is not a virgin. She's actually the favorite queen of a king named Shudhodana, in a wealthy, wonderful, right on the foothills of Himalaya uh, kingdom at the to top of India, kind of, of the Shakyas kingdom, it's called. And um, when he's born, uh, the mother. Uh, and he's conceived, though, without the father's uh, involvement. That is, when the mother's on a retreat away from the father. So there's no seed from the father. And this is a typical trope in mythic terms, where someone who's going to be a huge rebel against the patriarchal culture is born without the father. You know? And, of course, Jesus has the same trope. And I think Hercules, and other, when they have divine fathers, you know, her, you know, mythic heroes have that trope. And Buddha has it but a little different because they're not so uptight, maybe, as the Western people, Mediterranean people. So she doesn't have to be a virgin, you know. But he's conceived without the father. So he's sort of magically conceived, and she's in ecstasy throughout the whole pregnancy. And there is an actual text where she describes what it's like. And it's a very busy pregnancy. She, she feels like her womb is like the universe. And then there are all these deities and beings and magical creatures coming in and out. And Buddha's sitting in a little pagoda inside her womb, and he's teaching them as an infant, as an embryo, he's already teaching. And she, which she describes in a marvelous way. It's actually amazing. It's like, imagine if, I bet there was, frankly, I bet in Christian literature there was some record of Mary saying something about what it was like. I mean, you conceive God's child, and it must be groovy. I mean, you must have like good hormones going on with that, but you never hear from her. Right? Except she's out there worrying when this horrible things happen to him. But um, there must be, but it got suppressed by the Mediterranean patriarchs, you know, probably. You know, um, women are a little less honored, perhaps, in that part of the time, the part of the world in those days. So uh, she's in this blissful condition. And then again, when uh, she's ready to deliver, she leaves, which is part of that culture, she leaves the husband's house to go to the father's house, to her, birth house, her own birth house, and gives birth there. It's the usual pattern in that of the aristocratic royal families in that time. But she doesn't get there, and she gives birth in nature, in a garden, sort of like a main, parallel to a manger. There's one Japanese scholar who has found 22 parallel incidents in the baby Jesus story and the Buddha story, the Buddha life and the Jesus life. And um, it's a very interesting study, Kajime Nakamura. And some of you might be interested in that, and I can give you that reference. And um, then she's feeling a little tired in this garden where she stops on the way to her father's palace in another kingdom. And uh, she leans on a tree, and then Buddha very kindly, you know, natural childbirth of the best kind, 
just emerges from her side without any incision or without any labor or without any problem. He just floats through the molecules of her side. And he stands on the ground on his two feet. And he holds up this one finger like this. And he says, I'm the best thing on two feet. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks here and there a little bit. <clears throat> but then when the father is summoned and comes, he goes and he starts acting like a baby again. Because he doesn't want to make the father nervous that he might be some weird creature or something talking at birth. But the mother and the bride, you know, the, the attendants don't mind. And it's a scene like where there's animals and lions and tigers and deers all lying around and everything is blooming all over, although it's a early spring. So there's a very elaborated, you know, magical kind of moment. And then an unusual thing happens, which the mother never comes back to her body. And then this is, uh, this is rationalized in various ways in different traditions. The Pali people say, that this always happens with a Buddha's mother, who's in their last life, the Buddha life. Because if a mother was to grow, were to be with her son as a Buddha son, Bodhisattva son, in his last life and growing up, and then he would leave home, which the Buddha does eventually, in his, around 29 usually, or mid-20s, then that would break her heart. You know, then he'd go and become an ascetic and struggle and suffer you know, the way he did. So that they always just pass away upon giving birth. And then that's the most down to thing. And then the, the most elaborate thing is where she says to her husband, um, sort of, she says, OK, I did my job. I brought Buddha to birth as a prince. And from now on, I don't feel like the infrastructure around here. <laughs> I'm not into the plumbing in your palace. I'm not into this body. I'm not, uh, that's it for me. I'm going to the Indra's heaven, to Olympus, basically. Indra's heaven of 33 is, is the Indian Olympus. And she does go there. And it's just, just too blissed out to sort of pull herself together and go around and be the queen, you know, and be the mom. And she has a sister who's also a queen, who becomes the mother, foster mother of the Buddha, a Prajapati, and, and basically is his mother in life. But I mean, some people like Mark, I'm always joking around with Mark Epstein, because he thinks this is a big trauma for Buddha, losing his birth mother. And he must have known. But, and therefore, it was, he was trying to fill. And it's just really, Freud also thought that Buddha was seeking to return to the womb. He was so freaked out. And that in nirvana is just a return to the womb. You know, it's the oceanic feeling of going back into the womb. But meanwhile, in Buddhism, they don't think it's that much fun to be in the womb. That's why they kick as soon as they can. And when mom rides in a bumpy, Maserati or something, they really kick. They don't want to be bumped when she has cold ice cream or hot spice. She, but the being doesn't like it in the womb. In other words, they have sufferings in the womb in Buddhist uh, medicine and so on. But who knows? So, so anyway, then he's born and then he's brought up. Then he's a complete, then there is a, a monk who comes. Uh, the uh, soothsayer, father kind of freaks out. But he had many wives, and he, he was deeply in love with Maya, but he respects her wishes, so to speak. And he has other, and Prajapati is her sister, but also beautiful, wonderful queen. And he has lots of other, he has a harem the way they did. And so he manages, and then he's very proud of his son. And um, he takes the son to, um, this is another parallel episode, according to Hajime Nakamura. He takes the son to the ancestral Vedic temple, Brahminical temple. And when he takes him into the temple, the deities on their pedestals, you know, Brahma, Shiva, etc., or the earlier Vedic forms of those, Rudra, etc., they come to life. They get down off the pedestals. They come over and they bow to the baby. Then they go back and get on the pedestals and turn back into stone or metal or whatever they were. There's an incident like that. And then uh, Nakamura points to there's an incident apparently in some apocryphal gospel. And this is a Middle Eastern versus India difference, actually, so it's kind of amusing. And where Joseph and Mary go into an Egyptian temple. And when they take baby Jesus into an Egyptian temple, all the Egyptian god statues explode <laughs> into dust. And they don't get up again. <laughs> they get wasted. <laughs> You know, anti-icon, you know, anti-idolatry sort of story. You know, which apparently didn't get into the four main gospels, but it was in one of the uh, one. Or, 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 you know, Anakamura found that. 
So there's all that kind of parallel things in the two stories. So then, um, and then the father calls that soothsayer. Actually, the soothsayer comes by himself with a bunch of followers, flying through the air, levitating through the air, like he must have taken Maharishi's course or something. And he lands there, and uh, he says, I want to see this baby. You know? And the father says, okay, tell me about my son. And then when he looks at him, he's smiling and very happy with this radiant child, and then he starts weeping. So then the father gets all uptight and says, why are you weeping? And uh, was something wrong with the kid, or what's that matter? You know? He says, no, 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 no. This kid is far out. He's going to be a perfect Buddha. But I'm crying because I will be dead by the time he does become a perfect Buddha. I will not get a chance to be, receive his teaching in this life. So that's why I'm weeping for myself. And then the father says, but what do you mean he's going to be a Buddha? What does that mean? The father's a king, right? Warrior class, that is. You know? He's a general of the army. And he says, oh, well, OK, if you don't want him to be a Buddha, by leaving home and becoming a Buddha, becoming a Shramana, you know, a seeker, and then a Buddha, then you have to make sure he doesn't know anything about suffering in his youth. Until he's 30 years old, you have to keep him in the household, and then maybe he'll be a king, and if he's a king, wow, he'll conquer the whole world. So dad is like, oh, that's great, I want to conquer the world, my son. So then he's brought up as a spoiled brat with uh, all kind of dancing girls and a wild adolescence and whatever, what have you. He also learns everything. He goes to some teacher and he knows 45 languages more than the teacher does right away. And mathematics, he's like a, you know, he's a genius. You know, he's a prodigy. And so he doesn't take his studies very seriously. And he learns the martial arts because he's supposed to be a general and a king, but he doesn't pay much attention and he's much better than anybody else. And um, he has some thoughtful moments. Mark Epstein loves the moment where He's sitting under a tree as a child of maybe eight, five, six, seven, eight years old. And the father is doing the ritual plowing that the king is supposed to do at the beginning of springtime to start the planting, you know, the farmers. And a sort of ritual thing where the king plows the first furrow. And then he notices that the plow is killing a lot of insects. And so he kind of withdraws and he goes into a kind of samadhi state. The Buddha does, and then they say, where's, where's Siddhartha, you know, which is his name. Siddhartha means one who will achieve his aim. And where's Siddhartha? And they say, well, he was over under the tree, and then they notice that there's a light around him, and he's like in total samadhi, naturally. So then the father gets up tight and goes, wake him up and get him over here. And so that's a very important incident, Mark Epstein thinks, where he has a gentle, peaceful, blissful, you know, dhyana or meditative state. And uh, he has another wonderful incident in that youth is where his his half-brother, who's the actual son of Prajapati, the foster mother, and therefore always jealous of the Buddha, of Siddhartha, shoots a goose, a wild goose, flying, or a swan, I, I forgot, I think it was a goose, Hamsa. And then the swan falls down near where Buddha is, and then Buddha grabs it, and then get, pulls out the arrow and binds the wound and saves its life. And then Devadatta comes and says, I shot it, I'm the hunter, it's mine. The Buddha says, no, I'm saving his life, it's mine. And then they take it to the court, and the judge is fine for the Buddha. So then David Dutta gnashes his teeth again, and always happens. So, so then, at a certain age, he becomes sick of uh, all his partying, and, then they, and he's starting to get pensive. And, and then the father, wise men advise the father, well, maybe he's tired of all this sexuality, this meaningless sexuality, and he wants to be married. You should have a wife, you know. So then he, there's a wonderful scene where all the most beautiful maidens in the country come, there's a, and he gives jewels to all of them. And then when he's out of jewels, this last one comes, who came last and late, because her father didn't want her trying out for this, so to speak, even though he was the top prince, because the father thought he was a wimp, because he was always hanging around in the pleasure palace. He wasn't a good warrior, and the father was a warrior, the king's a warrior. She doesn't want his daughter marrying a wimp. But she has a destiny to go, she feels. So she comes, and he has no more jewels when she gets there. And then in love at first sight, boing, you know. So he takes off his own diadem, an emerald thing, and gives it to her. It's a wonderful scene. But then the father again steps in and says, no way, just because he gives some jewel. He can't have my daughter. He has to have a tournament and win the tournament to get her. Whoever is the winner of the tournament gets my daughter, not him. He says, thinking that Buddha will lose because he's been hanging around the harem, right? So then Buddha has to beat up David Dada again, <laughs> and everybody else, you know, and he does all kinds of things. It's a wonderful tournament scene. And then they are married, and then they live together. 
But then they live together a long time with no child, and they have a really good sex life. That's important to note for those shrinks who think Buddha was just seeking something because he didn't have a good sex life. They have a great one. In one of the poems, they're on their honeymoon, and they roll off to a low roof of their pleasure pavilion, and they land in a lotus bed, and they don't notice that they fell off. So they must have really been, <laughs> been going wild. And then their, their, their attendants come and hold up saris around them, this and that, and apparently they carry on. You know. So there are scenes like that. Indian literature is so sweet, it really is. But then, at a, certain, at a certain moment, she does get pregnant, and she has a child, a son. And at that moment, the father's overjoyed. He thinks he's gotten there. He, but that time, Buddha's 29. And he thinks, now I've got him nailed. Because the tradition is, when the crown prince has a son, the son becomes crown prince. The father can retire, because you know lifespan not necessarily that long, in his 40s or late 40s, maybe 50s. And father goes to a kind of retreat place, pavilion, has a, goes to Florida and takes a break. And the son gets the headache of running the kingdom. And so he says, OK, you have a son. Hey, you're the king. We're going to set up the coronation. Buddha says, OK, dad. As a king, I was supposed to protect my subjects, right? Oh, and by the way, during this time, before this, he's gone out of his pleasure circle, his Potemkin village, so to speak, pleasure village, four times. And the first time, he saw an old person, second time, a sick person, third time, a dead body, and fourth time, an ascetic, you know, a seeker, a person wearing orange robes and, you know, going around sort of in a more somatic, sort of peaceful vibe, seeking the meaning of life and death, this kind of person, you know, yogi kind of, shramana. They had no Buddhists at that time, but they had people who were seeking forest ascetics, you know. So he had seen these four things. So as they say, he went out with his charioteer and the father said, well, if he's going to go out, I want a Potemkin perfect village and town and everything. I don't want him to see anything unpleasant. But he does see these four things, they say. Which I think is a little unrealistic. And I think that his wife had sneaked him out of the palace to be more down to earth and realistic and had showed him the reality of the, and in my version of Buddha movie, she takes him out to a soup kitchen, <laughs> to a hospital, to a, you know, to a mortuary ceremony, you know, and he sees these things. She, she gets him to hip of what's going on in the world, you know. That's what I feel. She doesn't get credit, I feel. Yeah, show that. She's a great woman. And, um, then Buddha says, no. He says, that's, that's, he says, yes, I'm supposed to protect. Yes, son, you're going to protect your subjects. And Buddha says, well, that means I can protect them from sickness, old age, death, and suffering. No, son, you're not going to do that. That's for the priests. The, the gods take care of that. You just defend against the enemies, and you run the kingdom, and you collect the taxes, this kind of thing. And Buddha says, yeah, but that's not my real problems of my people. The real problems are sickness, old age, and death. So I'm not going to be king, because I couldn't do a good job. I'm going to go find out a way to protect them from what's really bothering them. And really? You, know, you don't want to be king? So then the father locks him up and sends in a bunch of Brahmin psychiatrists, you know, priests, you know, to like get him to shape up and get back onto the worldly treadmill. You know? So then um, he escapes. And then there's, that's one of the big deeds of his life, one of the four great deeds of his life, where he escapes. Cuts off his hair, takes off his clothes. He trades clothes with some ascetic who has these kind of cemetery shrouds. And um, the horse weeps, the charioteer weeps, the wife weeps when she gets back. But she weeps, interestingly, not just because he left her and the child, but because he didn't take her with him. She wants to attain enlightenment. She'd like to go. That's really what the reason she gives. She got a little bit dwells on the thing about the little boy's not going to have a daddy when while he grows up. But uh, mainly, she's upset that he didn't take her along. And um, he, doesn't do, he didn't take her along, he went by himself. So then six years he spends torturing him. For, well, he meets two teachers. First one teaches him to reach the, the formless realm state, or the, the realm state of absolute nothingness, which is you know, like your secularist nirvana, state of total unconsciousness but one in which you come into it like that's the ultimate place, you know, you think. It's past the realm of infinite space and infinite consciousness, sort of absolute nothingness, the ultimate quiet, right? And he enters such a state. And then in, in one day, they say, you know, he realizes that. And then his teacher says, wow, you know, you really have aptitude 
I am getting old and I will die soon. You will now lead my ashram here. And Buddha says, no, thank you, because that state is not the final state. That's just an escape state away from the relative, this part of the relative world. But it's a relative state in itself, even though it seems like an infinite state. An infinite state that has a boundary between it and the relative differentiated world is not infinite, because it had a boundary in space and time. So it's a relative mental state, but it's not the ultimate. Sorry. So the guy's very disappointed. He leaves, he goes to another ashram. And in that one, the guy goes still further, and he reaches the state which is one step beyond the nothingness state, which he also realizes in one day. He teaches the state beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, sort of a non-dual state of being totally infinite and unconscious and yet conscious of that in some way. And you are the whole universe, your consciousness is, and not you as an ordinary subject because there's no object. So it's a seemingly a very far out state, actually. It is actually a very far out state. And again, he rejects that, though. And then again, he's offered the ownership of that ashram, the leadership of that ashram, and he again abandons it. And he says, that's not it either, sorry. And uh, then he leaves, and he goes off, and he starts torturing himself, which he does for six years, starving. I don't know if any of you have ever seen, there's a marvelous sculpture in the Lahore Museum of him. It's from Gandhara, you know, from when, when Afghanistan was a Buddhist kingdom and down into North India, the Kushan kingdom. They made those, those dark stone carved statues, and the statue of the skeletal Buddha with the ribs and the veins. It's an amazing looking statue. I met that statue in 1962 when I was doing my fakir trip to India, yogi trip to India, and I saw that statue. It really blew me away. I was identifying with that. And it's really beyond, you know. One grain of rice a day, or sesame, I think one grain of rice a week, one, one sesame seed a day, and water, a little bit of water, and uh, sitting naked in the sun and, and in the winter and summer, etc. I mean, amazing. And even there's a story that his mother appeared to him from heaven saying, cut it out, you're going to kill yourself like that. And he said, don't worry, mom, I'll be up, I'll come teach you. He promised he would come teach her when he became enlightened. He sort of intuited he would get out of that. So then he comes to a point where there's, two, there's several versions of that story. The one I like is the tantric one, which are, the, the ordinary one is that he... At some point, he decides that this is silly. He's not getting anywhere, and he's just ruining his body. And he is going to collapse if he keeps that up. And some uh, village girl brings a bowl of yogurt and rice to him and honey, which he eats. And then he decides that, that the torturing the body is the wrong extreme. It's, an, it's too extreme, and it's silly. And his mind can't function, and he has to figure things out. He's uh, close to figuring it out. He's been meditating. But his body is so weak, he's being distracted by that. So he eats food, takes a bath, cuts his nails and hair, and um, cleans his uh, rags that he was living in and makes like a robe for himself out of pieces of a cemetery shroud colored orange by saffron, which apparently was the tradition at that time. And then his five compartners in asceticism get disgusted with him and they leave. And uh, then he goes and he gets fed and he gets grass, he sits under the tree, he says, I'm not moving from this spot until I have figured it out. I'm going to figure it out, he says. Then he sits there a day and a night. His body fills out like perfect from the one, the one bowl of this, you know, and then, which they don't explain that. They just say, gods come and fill it with all these vitamins or whatever. You know. Super, super energy food. But the tantric thing is really, I like it better, the tantric version. The tantric version is, He's still pushing ahead with his stubborn thing about he's going to leave everything. He's going to give up himself up in a certain way, conscious way, and to achieve awareness of the infinite of everything. And so he decides, well, I'm going without water, going without food, going without clothing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going without sleep. The one thing I haven't gone without is breathing. So I'm not going to draw another breath until I get it. So he's like, not going to breathe again. He's like stopping his breath, like a yogi. And he's passing out kind of from stopping his breath. And then he hears like someone snapping their fingers. And he looks up and he sees this beautiful goddess standing in front of him saying, what are you doing? You're going to choke yourself like that. And she says, come with me if you really want to get, some, get somewhere. And then his subtle body leaves his coarse body 
it leaves it kind of staying in a state of cataleptic trance. And his subtle body, you know, because he's a real yogi, you know, she takes her with her to a high heaven there. And there he's initiated in the mandala of Vairochana, you know, like well, a certain mandala, you know. And he's installed in that different feeling about sort of the, what they call the divine pride and the divine perception and the divine conception of himself as a Buddha and the universe as a Buddha verse. And he's sort of given the blessing to see it that way. And that's why his body fills out and he turns gold and this and that, because it's the subtle body. When the subtle body then comes back and reoccupies the coarse body, then the body suddenly is glowing and has this full health back. And that to me is much more, much more valuable. I prefer, I prefer that. But you know, never mind. The usual thing is it just, uh, it just takes a bowl of yogurt and rice and honey. So then he has three insights during that night. He has a little struggle with Mara. Mara, the devil comes up to him and offers him dominion over the earth, all knowledge, any power and riches, whatever he wants. And he says, that's really boring, I'm not interested. The devil then sends a bunch of girls, his daughters, and he looks at them and he says, Sky, girls, stop dancing like that, you're gonna give yourself a hernia. And he sees through them, he sees their skeletons and he's completely uninterested. And then they're, they're rejected. And then the devil attacks them with, they throw mountains at him and bombs and whatever they can with the whole demon army. And it all just falls at his feet like flowers. So the, the devil can't disturb him with either lust or hatred. So then the devil comes up to him and says, what is this? What, what are you, arrogant? What is your problem? You, who asked you to be Buddha? What is that? I'm going to be Buddha. I'm going to save all beings from suffering. The devil says. And then the Buddha says to him, says, well, how did you get to be the king of the devils, of the Maras? I can tell you, in, one, in my previous life, many aeons ago, you had a moment of compassion for another devil. And that made you, gave you the merit to be king of the devils, although mostly you do nasty things. You're the big tempter, you know. And, oh, well, you're right. I can remember that. I'm a, I'm a kind of demonic god, the devil says. And you're my witness. And what's your excuse to be Buddha? And he said, well, I did things like, I did everything. I gave my body, my life, my kingdom, my wife, my children, my eyes, my ears, my head, blood, everything to beings millions of times over many aeons. I accumulated so much merit. Every single being, I've done something fantastic to them. Now I'm going to be Buddha and help them become enlightened. And he said, well, you say so many things. The devil says, but who's your witness? Who could possibly witness all this stuff you claim? So then Buddha puts this one hand, he's sitting cross-legged, he puts the one hand down that you often see in Buddha statues with the one hand down here, and he's touching the earth. And he's saying, I call Mother Earth to witness. And then Mother Earth comes out, and she starts reciting Buddha's former lives, the Jataka tales. And they're more and less elaborate versions of the different stories. It's the one mother goddess, a mother earth goddess, Pertivi is her name in Sanskrit, like Persephone in Greek, or the same being, and starts reciting them. And in the more elaborated ones, she comes up with 16 earth goddesses who start to do a multimedia show of all of the Buddha's different previous lives, you know, when Buddha was was the lassie, when Buddha was old yeller, when Buddha was Bugs Bunny, when Buddha was Mickey Mouse, and he all did all these great things, you know, for everybody, king of the monkeys. And then, then the devil goes, drat, and he goes back to his thing and says, I'll get you later, you know. He, he doesn't destroy the devil, but he just overwhelms him like that. So, then he's, a, so then, he, then he's quiet and he meditates, and the first thing he understands is he remembers at the event horizon of realizing the nature of reality being nirvana, he realizes all his previous lives. And my, my theory is that the reason he can remember infinite previous lives at that point is not only that he's coming to a different relationship with, with time, but also he has overcome, he's reached the point where by being in the, in the event horizon of realizing the reality of nirvana, he realizes that he always was made of bliss that everything has always been bliss in every body he was in. He was always bliss, even when he died or he was tortured or he gave his life away or when some other horrible thing happened or when he was in a hell or in a bad state. It was just bliss anyway. He was just configuring it wrongly by his particular ignorance at that time. So that's why we don't remember our own previous lives because we suffered. We died, we didn't want to die. We suffered in the lives. We're frightened of doing that, so we have like that wonderful human thing where you don't remember what it was like when you broke your leg or your arm, you don't really remember the pain. 
So that's why we don't remember those previous lives so easily. But he remembered them, zoom, like that, all like infinitely. And then second, and more, more to the point of compassion, actually, he remembered everybody else's previous lives. So he realized, of course, that he'd been in every conceivable relationship with every other person, totally, forever. Everyone had been mom, everyone had been beloved, everyone had been enemy also. But why dwell on that? Mainly they'd been mothers to him. And he was linked to them in that way. He'd been mothers to them too. Because you have infinity, you can't say anything is excluded in eternity. You know? If you're having repeated, repeated, repeated relationships, you've all been everything to each other. You know? So those two things he remembered. And that second memory is the compassion entanglement with all living beings that he experienced, because he and they had been interwoven with each other in infinite past lives. And then, and then when he saw about them, he also saw all their different future prospects. And he saw all their multiple possible futures. And he remembered his will to compassion toward them. And he wanted them to have a minimal evolutionary trajectory to their own freedom and their own realization of the nirvanic nature of reality. So that was his sort of compassionate commitment to stay with them in, and, and to optimize their future evolutionary development. And he, he sort of spread himself that way into the future as well as into the past. And then he achieved the uh, nirvana, you know, finally. Everything, the perfection of everything. And he had a big grin on his face. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then he said, well, Sabshi uh, Oto, he said, in Tibetan anyway, which is profound, peaceful, clear light or transparent, complication free or trouble free, and uncreated. Like a, an elixir of immortality is the reality I have discovered. Whoever I would teach it to, they wouldn't understand. Without speaking, better I stay alone in the forest without speaking, he says, the second part. Which, of course, he didn't really necessarily intend, but it's just, it just was his feeling, you know. Like nobody, this, it's impossible to get, people won't get it. But actually, it was a message to the gods, in my opinion. He was being coy, he was waiting for his agent and his manager. And who, but a, who, what better manager than Brahma, the creator, who people thought was the creator? Then Brahma starts bugging him. He then stays 49 days in the woods, enjoying the incredible vision of infinite bliss, bliss void indivisible, as they call it, bliss freedom indivisible. And then Brahma keeps coming and bugging and saying, go teach people, go teach people, giving him visions. He gives him a vision of a, of a lotus pond, and there are different types of flowers in the lotus pond, and then the rain falls. And then Brahma says, look, the different lotuses are different. They don't all accept the water the same way, but they all are nourished by the rainfall. So just go and rain out the teaching and stop acting like nobody's going to understand it and doing all these things, and I'll help you. And here's the wheel of Dharma that all the Buddhas have used as sort of like the equivalent of a royal wheel symbol that you see on top of Buddhist temples. You know, there's this wheel with two deers looking at it. That wheel is the, symbolizes the wheel of the teaching. And so he gets a lot of, you know, Brahma has to ask him and ask him and ask him. The other gods also ask him a lot, often. And then, by the way, before he goes to give his first teaching of Four Noble Truths, these merchants come by, who are signifying the long-term relationship of Buddhism and capitalism. <laughs> Seriously. Why? Because Buddha was a traitor to his class. He was a warrior. But the warrior way of aggrandizing or getting prosperity is not very good. You go to the neighboring kingdom and you just kill them, destroy them, and you take their wealth. But then you've killed your customer. And you have, there's no one to deal with and exchange anything with next year. They can't make something for you. So it's really a, it's a zero-sum game. You know? Whereas mer, you know, merchant chaos, they go and they make deals, and they bargain, and they niggle and haggle with each other. But each one contributes something, and each one is enriched, ideally to some extent, gets something out of it. And then they get to their creativity, and they produce new things, and they come and trade again the next year. So it expands wealth much better than militarism, capitalism does. 
So he, they, you know, the merchant classes always were the ones to support the Buddha and everything. Anyway, these two merchants called Trapuchet and Palika come, and their, their caravan, a trade caravan, gets stuck in the mud near where Buddha's relaxing in the woods. And then they see a light over there in the woods, and they go over, and they see this ascetic there. And they say, oh, well, let's give him some lunch while we're waiting for him to be dug out of the mud. And then uh, Buddha says, yeah, well, that's a great idea, guys. You know, if you give lunch to sincere seekers who are seeking reality, you know, thinking of his future community, no doubt, he said, then you will prosper in your journey, you know. So please go ahead and here's a begging bowl. Then the gods brought him a begging bowl. You know, they have like usual methods like that. And um, they give him a big lunch. And then they go back and their thing is dug out and they go off and make a fortune in town, you know, in, in Benares, where they're going. This is a nice story. He doesn't mention a word about suffering to them. He doesn't say all oh, the suffering and he doesn't say that. Then he decides, well, okay, I'll go teach. Who will I teach? Uh, and he, he, he realizes his two yoga teachers have died, so he can't teach them and their people at the ashram, although he will eventually. And he five ascetics, he goes to the five guys who gave him up and went somewhere. So he goes and teaches them. Then he teaches them the Four Noble Truths. And uh, how am I doing? I have a little more time. Quickly. Four Noble Truths. That the unenlightened life is suffering is the first of them. And you all know this, right? Doesn't everybody know this? You've heard me do it a dozen times. People wrongly have thought it, Buddha was saying everything is suffering, period. Which is horrible. The Dalai Lama doesn't like that. He said that would be like somebody just going and going nya nya to somebody who's trapped and then they can't get out of the trap. Why bother to tell them if that really was the case? Well, he's, just, he's saying the unenlightened life is suffering. It's like a doctor who knows a cure and says, well, if you go like this, you're going to have this as a result to get people to take the cure. So he's saying the unenlightened life is suffering, and that's because of ignorance, basically, or desire, he told them, the ascetics. But the root of desire is ignorance. And that is the ignorance of thinking you are you and the world is different from you. And therefore, you need more of the world for you to sort of give yourself more on your side. If it's you versus the world, you need more things. You need wealth, you need relationships, you need property, you need friends. But you're doing a losing battle because the universe is infinitely other, and you can't get all of it. And it will always get you with sickness, old age, death, etc. Loss of friends, meeting of enemies, etc. They're all different lists of sufferings of, of, the, of the fundamental existential situation of you the real you versus the real other than you. That fundamental ignorance, or misknowledge, as I like to call it, right? So the second noble truth is the cause, is that misknowledge. But then the really great one, the third noble truth, nirvana, the cessation of that suffering, the healing of that suffering, the freedom from that suffering. That's the one that's, and that's the only one that's really real. After all, the first two are ignorance and its, and its cause, which are, in a way, it isn't like the reality is that they're suffering. It's just because you're ignorant of the reality, the unreality of suffering. You follow me? So, that, so but, and then coming back to the plane of the unreality, then he says the real reality is nirvana. And then going back to the unreality, acknowledging that the unreality of suffering, of the ignorance-driven suffering, is something to, it still has some reality. It's an unreal reality, but it has some reality. And that unreality can be cured by the Eightfold Path, the Fourth Noble Truth. And then the Eightfold Path is a total life curriculum. And what I am saying now, coming back to something, I am saying a force for good, a force for good comes from the awareness of the nirvanic nature that the nature, that reality is at its deepest level good, actually. And it actually is a good that provides an inexhaustible force for those who seek to type, tap, to tap that force. You know, it's like uh, the clear light of the void. It's, if, you, if you can think of a field of infinite energy is the sort of fabric of everything since it's infinite, it doesn't do anything because there's nothing more to be done. Once the energy is infinite, everything is already done <laughs> in a way. But anybody who thinks something needs to be done, if they're aware of that, they can draw inexhaustibly from that infinite energy, if you follow me, and then that becomes the force. 
Therefore, how many of you have seen the new Star Wars? Oh, good, lots of you. I do assign a lot of sci-fi movies and Doctor Who and things like that when I teach. I think it's very important. I know some people who are very spiritual, they don't like television. And I don't blame them, most of the garbage. But sci-fi is very, very useful. I use it often, the Matrix, the Avatar, but anyway. So, so the, the point is that although it doesn't do anything itself, this force for good, it's not the creator of the universe, but it is what the universe is made of. And there is a, the quantum people have a concept like this, they call it the zero quantum point vacuum field or something like that. They take those words and arrange them in some order or another. <laughs> and it's sort of the idea that the vacuum has infinite potential or infinite energy. There's supposedly nothing there, but actually it's infinite energy. Some kind of paradox that they come up with mathematically. I don't really very properly understand it. Any physicist, quantum physicist in the room or on the line can explain it to me. And they've tried before, but I forget. Actually, the Dalai Lama has a funny thing here that I thought was very cute. He says to Dan Goldman, the story of the, of the Yeti, the abominable snowman, and the marmot. And how the abominable snowman hunts marmots. It's probably a Tibetan tale. <laughs> and the abominable snowman sits over like a marmot nest, you know. And then he sees a marmot and he grabs it. And then he puts it under, his, under himself, sits on it to keep it. And then another marmot comes and then he reaches up to get it, but then he gets up and the marmot underneath him like runs away. Then he puts it under there. So the Dalai Lama says what he learns in the dialogues with scientists or like the marmot that he puts to sit on. Then when he gets up to get another one, it runs away. <laughs> that's really quite cute, I think. Anyway, anyway, that's the third noble truth, is the force for good, really. But it doesn't do it by itself, because it's already done. It's good. Everything is goodness. That's the default reality. But on the other hand, people who are trapped in the realm driven by misknowledge and who see things that seem awful, and they see others suffering due to ignorance, of course, and they could sit back and say, well, you're not really suffering. They could sit back and tell themselves, I'm not really suffering, this is nirvana, and yet they have a pain somewhere, or a frustration, or a, a need, or a fear, so actually they are suffering. Or unreally, it's a little unreal, but it's real enough to make them unhappy. And so they, however, this force that's humming there, kind of, doesn't do anything by itself, but they can draw from it. And of course, the ones who can really draw from it are Buddhas, who are fully aware of it, and then can shape it out of that energy. They can shape anything to deal with anyone, although then you get into the thing about where are they all, right? Why aren't they in Oregon disarming the loonies, <laughs> the loony John Bircher weirdo racist weirdos, coke-funded cuckoos? <laughs> Never mind. So. So the Eightfold Path, then, is a total curriculum. It's not being, it doesn't mean you have to be a Buddhist. You have to have a realistic worldview. If you get a more realistic worldview, which means you become fully accepting about causation. It doesn't mean you believe in Buddha or anything. He says, I'm Buddha, but don't believe in me. He says, for no reason. So causation. And causation, if you really accept causation, you start to erode right away that feeling that you have that the real me is something inside here that's really separate from everything else and it never changes and it's always sort of my point of from which I think of things and I'm always the same, it's always me, Bob, and it's, this and that is happening to me and what am I doing, what am I getting, who's doing what to me, and it's me, 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 you know, the real me in here, you know. Causation means the me in here is always being influenced by something. It's, I'm just a nexus of relativities. And it begins to erode that place of isolation in here that can be a source of megalomania when you're up and it can be a source of feeling isolated and lonely and depressed when you're down. And it's this wrong investment and, and wrong mental habit. It's the essence of what misknowledge is, of thinking that we are what we are by virtue of an intrinsic identity or reality that is us. Intrinsic meaning that is, comes out of itself, that is like an absolute me which we sort of subliminally and subconsciously think. And of course, some people have theories that seem to support that, actually. A lot of even religions do, and other things do support that. Crazy idea that an absolute thing can relate to a relative thing. Some theologies have that kind of cuckoo idea. 
When it's, whereas really, when they say something like that, like, oh, the absolute somebody did something, they're just using the word absolute like we say, do you want a cup of tea? You say, absolutely. <laughs> you want to take a break? Absolutely. But absolutely, you can't want anything because absolute means non-relational. So therefore, you can't absolutely want tea. You can only relatively intensely want tea. <laughs> right? So, so, um, so that's a realistic worldview. Then once you have realistic worldview, you realize you are a causal process in evolution, and you, you can either evolve in a positive direction or a negative one. And a positive one is toward wisdom and love and compassion and happiness. And a negative one is deeper misknowledge and anger and fear and dissatisfaction and deeper ignorance and depression and so on. And so those are two possible things that causality will influence you by. And therefore, you have to choose to influence and direct yourself positively. So then you get realistic motivation, where you start becoming responsible for shaping your evolutionary trajectory. And then, also, realistic worldview means there's no final end to anything, and there's no final beginning to anything. It's a beginningless and endless. So you become really committed to making sure you're going better, because it can go endlessly in any direction. So you are responsible. Tiniest little increment of more positive rather than more negative becomes of infinite importance to you. And then from that, you do the ethical things, which are realistic ethical action, realistic speech, which is a very important type of action, what we say. And I'll unpack these in later classes. And realistic livelihood. You don't want to have a livelihood which is harmful to people. Because that will, even though you consciously think, well, I'm just doing what people do, but actually, you know subliminally you're doing something that's causing harm, and you, it will haunt you, and you won't like it. It'll be bad for you. It creates a bad evolutionary impact on you. right? So you do corporate ethical whatever. You know? And then finally, in, in, you know, uh, uh, realistic creative effort. So you don't be lazy and just let yourself go with the flow, which might take you negative. You choose your path you know, with creative effort toward the good. And then the last two, that's, a, that's six, uh, six branches of that path. And the last two are realistic mindfulness, or awareness of the minute way that your mind works, and of things in life, of things that you do. And you could, do, you could say something a little more skillfully or less skillfully. You could be a, a little more of this or a little more of that. And you realize that has infinite impact, so you're very careful to be a little better. And uh, then finally, realistic concentration, or samadhi, uh, meditative power and focus. And those eight things, are none of them are religious. The world you think is causality. It's like almost a science. It's a, it's, a, it's a determination to be realistic about what the world is based on an initial giving the benefit of the doubt to Buddha and many thousands of people who have followed him, also many saints and other kinds of traditions who have said, like that my Christian friend Mr. Beckwith, all right already that the great visionaries of history have said, Everything actually is all right if you didn't mess it up. In other words, the default thing. And the theists say that's because God's love is everything is made of God's love. That's what creates everything. And they, they go beyond the little old guy sitting there with a beard and what, dishing out some, some soy sauce or something. I don't know what he does. <laughs> some gefilte fish or whatever he dished out. <laughs> right? Some unleavened bread or horseradish. So, so, so that's the Eightfold Pass. You know? And that, Buddha, that was Buddha's basic... Therapy it was Buddha's basic force for good. It was his vision for the world, that Eightfold Path, what the, the education system. And what you see the Dalai Lama's doing, he's not talking Buddhism. He's not talk, he does do that for Buddhists, but he's not talking any of these things. He is trying to change the education system to bring more compassion and love into people's minds as part of their education. Which, and of course, the root of compassion and love is wisdom. It's realistic wisdom, knowing what reality is. The more you know what reality is, the more you know you really do depend on others. And the, you know, your life, the quality of your life is constituted by your relationships with others to a huge degree. And therefore, you will find in you the resources to be more loving and compassionate to others. And then you'll be happy. Right? His famous slogan is, you want to be happy? Be compassionate. He even sometimes puts it, he says, you want to be successfully selfish? Be a wise selfish and realize that you'll be fulfilled when you fulfill others. This will be your way of fulfilling yourself. If you think about how can I get more, you'll always be dissatisfied, and you'll never have enough. 
and therefore you will be an unwise selfish, and you will be a frustrated and a discontented selfish. He sometimes puts it like that. Sometimes he just puts it, if you want to be happy, be compassionate. Do something for someone else. Then that will make you happy. Think about them. Uh, you know, think about what you could do for them even, and that will make you happy. Okay? So then he, Buddha struggled, uh, and the reason, the different attempts to make movies and stuff about the life of the Buddha have not been successful in general is that they always end with enlightenment when he's only 35. And uh, so people don't know what that is, so they say this guy, he was a happy prince, he had a beautiful wife, he had a nice son, he ran away and left him, and then he like starved himself for six years, and then Eureka, I'm enlightened, and then goodbye. What is that? Like, you know, he abandoned his family, and like, what? They think it's kind of strange, and they wonder why it's being celebrated, you know, because they don't know what enlightenment is. Meanwhile, the proof of the enlightenment is his action. It's his force for good, and what he tried to do in India for the next 45 years, of teaching people, getting their love and compassion and wisdom, etc., going, weakening and criticizing the caste system, the rigid oppression of the lower castes, criticizing the negative and unrealistic philosophies like waiting for the gods to fix things up and so on, criticizing the kings and their wars and their oppressions and so on, criticizing dishonesty and dealing with all levels of things. Eventually, although very reluctant to take on that issue, but ahead of his time, he took on the issue and he allowed there to be a female, female mendicant community, which was his innovation, actually. They didn't have that thing at all before. And he was very resistant to it, not because some feminists in modern times have thought he was a chauvinist himself, because they don't, academic scholars about Buddhism are against the idea that somebody could be enlightened and have a higher consciousness. So they want to attribute ordinary, mundane motives to this enlightened being, which is silly of them, but that's their way. But the reason he hesitated is because he was practical, you know. He didn't go in and try to have a revolution take over the palace. He didn't become, he could have easily gone back and taken the throne of his own kingdom and ordered everybody to be a Buddhist in the kingdom and then like gone out and conquered everybody else and say, everyone be a Buddhist. But that's not the way to do it. Then people would have resisted and have hated it and it would have been horrible and it would have been contrary to his thing. He totally rebelled against the religion of his time. This is a key point. Later it's considered a world religion, but and it is for people who don't use it as an education. But he himself, you know, the father sent many Vedic priests and psychiatrists and people into the woods to find him and persuade him to come back and join the kingdom and give up this silly idea of trying to attain enlightenment to help all beings. Instead, come back and run the kingdom and conquer the world. And they, and they gave him all the religious arguments of the Vedic Hinduism. And he rejected them all. And actually, most of them would then give it up, quit, and join him and become one of his followers, actually, after a while, and become mendicants themselves. So he was completely rebelling, but he didn't set up his community of mendicants, not monks, actually, which is a Christian term, but mendicants, people who lived on alms. He didn't set them up to challenge the Brahmin priests. He said they can't do birth ceremonies, they can't do divinations and tell fortunes, even if they're clairvoyant. They can't do funerals. They can't do weddings. They do none of the jobs that priests do so that they weren't competing for the livelihood of the priests. So he, many of the priests joined the Mendicant Order, but he didn't challenge the whole institution, in other words. But on the other hand, he, he, he did challenge them in the sense that he said, one is a, a Brahmin by virtue of wisdom and ethicality and compassion for people to impassionate behavior, which is ethicality. He did it, he, you're not just a Brahmin by birth. If you're born the children of Brahmin family and you're a brat, then you're not a Brahmin. There's nothing pure about you. You know, Brahmin means something pure, you know, you know, priest caste. So he, 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 he had a revolutionary, actually, impact in his society, in his time, Buddha did. And he did, he was doing it, his equivalent of a force for good. And actually, he rationalized the karma theory as an evolutionary Darwinian theory, which it wasn't at that time. He, he reshaped the theory of, of karma, of action that shapes life, into making it an ethical theory, out of it having been a sort of religious theory, 
that the gods reward you or punish you, depending on if you follow the, you know, make offerings to the gods and behave yourself or not, you know. And he changed that. He said, no, it isn't that. It's your own action that shapes your future, you know, whether you, you yourself are kind and wise and self-restrained and whatever, you know. Uh, he made it like that. You're realistic in the way you treat people. And then uh, after an 8081, he uh, attained parinirvana, which means thorough nirvana. And he said, and then they were weeping. They said, oh, you can't leave and this and that. And he said, well, I couldn't stay longer, but it's better for you to have the message about how time is limited in your lifetimes and you have to do something. And I'll be around in other ways, he said. But I'm, I'm tired of this particular body and I'm, I'm affirming that everything is nirvana and I haven't abandoned anybody. You know, one of the names of Buddha is present in all three times. Triadvanya, knower of all three times. So past, present, and future, when you attain Buddhahood, you're in all three. So you don't depend on a particular separated body, actually. But we'll get to that in future readings. We'll deal with that kind of issue. So that's how he didn't abandon his vow to save all beings from suffering. Because he's still saving us. Like, I'm still suffering. So he's, he, didn't, he abandoned me. I could feel that. But he's, he's actually been around the corner, like, making sure I did this and didn't do that. The other, he's been helping me in a subtle way. Different people emanating, whatever, although I don't know that. But I think that that's the theory, in other words present at every moment of time. Like a Teilhard de Chardin type of theory, actually, sort of. But not based on omnipotence. Because unfortunately for him, he could, you know, enlightenment doesn't mean you just, because you're in bliss, you can't bomb everybody else to be in bliss. Like be a bliss bomb for them. You can't do it. Because if they had this big energy flowing at them, they'd get more uptight. They, they would feel they were being invaded, like the alien was coming and taking birth in their stomach or something, like in those horrible horror movies. So people have to open up their mind to their reality themselves. So teaching is the way that Buddha helps people. OK, that's it. Now any questions? That's enough lecture. Now questions. Um, yes. Just a, just a minute, just for our streamers. OK. All right. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, just was, um, I just was wondering if you could maybe define um, how you view secularism, and if, if by that you mean agnosticism, and also um, the quote, the, the, the actual nature of the world is Nibbana. That the part, most what, the, most the actual nature of the world is Nibbana. You had started that? Nirvana, yeah. sorry, Nirvana. Nirvana. Yeah. And I was wondering about that, because sometimes it feels like we're in a hell realm, and I'm just wondering it how felt like what, like what? that it that we're in somewhat of a hell realm. And I'm just yeah. wondering how... Sometimes you feel it's like a hell realm. Right? Yeah, it kind of seems like that. It that's kind of looks Republicans like that. That's why the Republicans are in power. Well, I guess maybe that's why I'm feeling this way. I don't know, because it's getting scarier <laughs> right. every day. But um, right. I don't know how, how does someone... Is it my ignorance that I don't see that we're in nirvana? Or, or how, how does that manifest right. itself? Well, you see the... The first question, that's quite a few questions. The first question was about, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, but, oh yeah, about, I'm sorry, what was the first question again? Secularism, like how it's defined, is that agnosticism? Oh, it's secularism, yes, that's secularism. Well, what, secularism is this um, thing that we get in science classes from modern science. Uh, what they call modern science, which uh, should be based on evidence, experimental experience, right? And they feel somehow they've discovered that human beings don't have a mind apart from their brain and body. So they've discovered that when you die, you're going to be nothing. So that means actually, logically speaking, they feel they have discovered nothing. And they actually don't have evidence for that because there is no evidence for nothing. When you don't find something, you might say, that, well, there was nothing there. But you haven't found nothing. You just didn't find the something you were looking for. There is, was nothing means what isn't there. <laughs> so you can't discover it. So the assurance that they purport to assure us with, that we don't have a, a continuum of mind, a subtle energy process of consciousness, that can operate and continue on its own like other energies, like thermal energy in the body, you know, when it's burned in the, in the crematorium or whatever, you know, or when it becomes fertilizer in the soil, 
you know, the, the thermodynamic continuation of energy, the one kind of energy that doesn't continue is the energy of the mind. And in a way, religious people make it easier for them by saying that the mind is not matter or not energy. It's some other thing than it's information, sometimes they'll say, or say something like that, or structure. But actually, of course, it is energy. You know, you're, when you think something, when you know something, something happens. So that means it moves, that means it's energy. So secularism is based on that blind faith thing, based on an attempt to evade the fear inculcated by brimstone and fire preachers in the West, and also actual Inquisition type of people burning scientists at the stake. So to defend themselves against that, they have tried to assure the population they don't have to worry about their future past deaths because they're going to be nothing, and science assures them of that, which they actually is a false assurance. It's a totally blind faith assurance. Like I presume to say, now here, there I a little bit go beyond Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama actually would agree with me in a Buddhist setting, but he feels that, that that's somehow too Buddhist and he doesn't want to freak out his scientific dialogue partners by pushing that, so he doesn't. He ignores it. He ignores that and tries to work with where he can work, whereas I like to get into that with him <laughs> rather forcefully indeed, because I think that that's a very, that, that, that view is, just, first of all, it's very dogmatic. It discards all evidence that people have of remembering previous lives, of hearing from loved ones who have died, you know, in some dream or even in a waking experience, ghost-like type of thing. And all of that is just all discarded, it's all anecdotal or it's hallucinating or whatever it is. And meanwhile, there's zero evidence that everybody has become nothing or that anything could become nothing. It's even, and it's contrary to their own law of thermodynamics of the continuation of energy. So um, I feel they should, that should be pointed out anyway, even if it freaks some of them out. You know? so, so that's the thing about secular. And, and I feel that it relates to a kind of recklessness of our culture where you know, we'll keep having carbon you know, pouring into the sky so we can have some heating and some electricity. And Las Vegas can pump out its electricity and Times Square and so on, wasted a tremendous amount, uh, because somehow we'll muddle through or never mind the grandchildren or even if the whole planet destroys, then everybody will just return to the nothing, which they really are. Life is meaningless. You know, evolution is a random mutation, it's an accident, no purpose to it all. All of this assuring us as if they discovered this, which they haven't, actually. And it's actually an incredibly depressing worldview. It's all meaningless and pointless. Why bother with whatever? But, but those who are comfortable in it, then, there's, then they can sort of, well, I can at least have fun or grab some stuff and would do whatever I can get away with. But it's very, very reckless and very, very destructive. And it's imprisoned someone in deciding that I personally, not only my genes, but I personally am an evolutionary entity and there's an opportunity to evolve into something even more amazing and there's no limit to how I can evolve given that I have an infinite possible future. And even if I'm, you know, like Pascal had a great wager in a Christian setting about how, you know the Pascal wager? Well, he wagered that if he didn't, if his soul did not exist, and he, didn't, he simply ceased to exist at death, he wouldn't regret having prepared for something after death. And if it did exist, and in his case, belief in God and Jesus and all that, he would very much regret if he hadn't acted in terms of the teaching of Jesus and so forth, and therefore was among the chosen and went to a nice place, hung out with Jesus rather than down in the pit. You know? And so that was a win-win to him. You know? And the lose, there was no lose to it because you just didn't exist, so you wouldn't regret having wasted time being virtuous, right? So you can take that in the evolutionary Buddhist sense. You know? so, so that's my critique of secularism. But the Dalai Lama is more positive than me, and he likes to say, well, but there's a humanistic thing, a love for their children, a concern they can still have for the future, even if they are not in it, and they think it's great to be nothing and whatever. And so we'll build on that rather than criticize them for that, since they probably won't accept it, he feels. You know? And that's fine for the moment, but I think finally, you know, this worldview that after me, the flood, you know, après moi le déluge, as they say, as the French king said before he was guillotined, you know, before he knew he would be guillotined, he said, après moi le déluge, let there be a flood after me. You know, that attitude, which was the W's attitude, for example, on record, he didn't care about the environment because he'd be dead when the really bad effects would occur. 
And now that's too reckless, you know, and destructive of other people and so on. So it has to be challenged, I feel. That's the secularism thing. Then the thing about nirvana is, of course, Buddha didn't say you have to believe in nirvana. He said you, you have to imagine it, realizing that it would be very difficult. And also he was very, very minimalist in describing it as simply freedom from suffering. He didn't really, in the, early, in, in the sort of fundamental or the basic levels of his teaching, emphasize the bliss aspect. Because he knew people would be suspicious about that. Because bliss is something dangerous, you know, bliss is something scary. Bliss is usually illegal, I, used to, I would say, basically, in, in, in authoritarian societies. You know, if people are too blissful, they won't work and they won't do this and that. You know. So uh, he was very careful and cautious about that. He said, freedom from suffering. And, um, and then basically he said, and I, I'm Buddha, and I know this clearly, and this is a prescription. It's like a, it's a medical diagnosis. Symptom, is suffering. Cause, ignorance. Prognosis, you can cure it. And therapy, the Eightfold Path. Education of the Eightfold, three educations of the Eightfold Path. You know, uh, philosophical or intellectual, scientific education, ethical education, and psychological education. Those are the three, those Eightfold Paths are the three educations. So he said, I don't ask you to believe in me, though. You should, in fact, doubt what I tell you. Because if you just believe somebody says something nice and they're cute or something, then for no reason, it's bad to have blind faith in anything because then you'll, have faith, then you'll believe anything because you don't have a reason, so your faith is completely wishy-washy and some more cute person comes and says something, okay, well, that's the, you know, you don't have any reason. So blind faith is no good. But what you do is try to be more realistic. Use your common sense about reality. Is it possible that anything can be nothing? For example, just think about that. Is nothing really there as a place people can be? Think about that. Can something absolute, if I feel I'm really absolute, can that be in me as a relational entity? How would it relate to me and not be relative? Use your common sense in simple thinkings like that. And if you begin to get a little understanding from that and your feelings improve, you know, if you get all depressed, oh, I'm absolutely, it's all horrible, it's like a hell, I'm just, oh, I'm worthless, it's awful, then you could find another voice that says, why do you think so? Who's saying that? Why, you know, that maybe not necessarily so. Begin to debate with yourself. Don't believe yourself what you think completely, but use your common sense. And if you begin to get a little advantage out of thinking in this more realistic way, then you can start giving me some credibility who suggested you think that way. But basically, you have to experience yourself, whatever anybody tells you, and think it through, and make it your own by understanding it. That was his whole approach as a teacher. Like what we're supposed to do as liberal arts teachers, you know? Education, educare, supposed to lead out the common sense, the good sense and the wisdom of the student. You're not just supposed to brainwash them with some propaganda, and then they're supposed to believe that and regurgitate it on an exam. That's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> some of us do, and some of us don't. Right? Is that, was that all your questions? Not forever all your questions. I'm sure there are more. Yeah, that, I, I, Those were the two you asked. Is that right? The two I asked, yes. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yes. Oh, my Shonyata friend. Uh, when, oh, God. No, take the mic. Oh. Take the mic. Uh, when, uh, I, as Hold it close I, by. As far as I understand, sutra means the word of Buddha. Is Sutra yes. means the word of Buddha. And is this the Buddha, the original Buddha, or sutra? Yeah, well, sutra actually literally means Sorry. sutra actually means a thread, and uh, it has other meanings in Sanskrit. It can have another meaning. It can mean like an aphorism. But in Buddhism, it refers to texts that purport to record words of Buddha or words of another person, sort of authorized by the Buddha. For example, Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra is mostly speech of Vimalakirti and Manjushri. Buddha does speak in the beginning and the end, but the idea is it's sort of under the aegis of the Buddha. Heart Sutra is spoken mainly by Avalokiteshvara, but Buddha's in a samadhi of teaching at the time nearby, so the idea is he's inspiring Avalokiteshvara to speak. So Sutra, in a way, is best translated in Buddhism as a discourse of the Buddha. And can I ask a second? Can I ask a second question? What? Second question related to this. I'm sorry, the what? 
May I ask another question? Oh, another question, yeah. yes. Uh, when, when they talk about three, uh, three turns of the wheel, yes. is this during the time of the original uh, Buddha, or is it...? Yes, okay. that's, what the, that's what the commentators say, and the later sutras refer to that. The Buddha, the sutra called the revelation of the, or the elucidation of the intention sutra, Samdhinirmochana Sutra, which is again attributed to the Buddha, and I believe we have no reason to doubt that. We have no disproof of that, although uh, because they were kept like uh, they were not propagated by his followers at his instruction for four centuries. The modern people think they were kind of made up later and then attributed back to the Buddha. But, uh, but the Buddhists think they were actually by Buddha, but he said keep them in the background for 400 years because the society is not ready for the non-dualist teaching. They need a dualist teaching for, for, for about four centuries, which is about, what, 20 generations, something like that. Then they'll be ready for the non-dualist thing, he said. But they can't believe in that, you know, modern people, because that means a kind of sociological and historical vision they will not accept somebody having. And uh, uh, so in that sutra, he refers to the three turnings of the wheel of dharma for a certain reason, yeah. And the first of them is the Four Noble Truths type of teaching. Second one is the emptiness type of teaching. And third one is sort of emptiness and non-emptiness, kind of like a refined kind of a refinement of the second one, something like that. And then the argument is, is the third one the highest one or the second one the highest one? And there's some argument there. And, and, but, and also that then means that the Buddha himself says that you cannot decide, you know, which of my teachings are the most definitive by something I say in a sutra because I'm always teaching a particular person or a group of people according to their aptitude and to help them. And when I teach them, I'm saying, this is the best one, because it is the best one for them. But therefore, you have to use reason to differentiate the way and pick out the most definitive of my teachings. The Buddha himself says that. So reason is key. You have to use reason. This sort of way Buddhism has been taught in America, that reason is useless, and you know you just meditate and don't think anything, and then you're going to have a big experience of space or something or empty space, and that's going to be enlightenment. That's a, mis, a misleading teaching, actually, not true. You have to learn, and you have to think critically. And when you get to deep points of doubt, of course, in thinking critically, thinking alone will not get you to a new experience. Then you may have to press down on the different points of doubt and break through to a new understanding. And that may be beyond what thinking can lead to, but it will only be queued up, let's say, queued up or teed up by a lot of deep thinking and learning, right? There are three kinds of wisdom, wisdom born of learning, wisdom born of critical thinking or critical meditating, and then wisdom born of one-pointed meditating, right? You know that anyway. You do. You're one of the, so now for you especially, this is teacher training. Now you have to teach other people. That's why this is teacher training. You already do, I'm sure, actually, because you've read and studied a lot. So I'm go, trying to get past the idea that I'm just introducing something, right? I'm trying to get where you can do your own, you can be a force for good effectively in this kind of curriculum, not religion, but curriculum yourself. Okay, another question. Any kind of question. Any other question? Okay, then I also said we would meditate. So that's not very good for people at home, but they will have to meditate too. So now think about these things. Maybe try to focus yourself on just the idea, which is our main framework, about this force for good. And those who have seen the Star Wars, and probably all of you saw the old Star Wars, the idea of the force, that there's this positive energy that is more powerful than negative energy. There is negative energy, but the most powerful one is positive energy. And there's a Sanskrit word, vajra, which means, can mean a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt, and it can mean a diamond. And it is the term that is used for the force of the clear light of the void, or the transparency of the void, which is what I referred to earlier in the class as the sort of plenum of quiescent but infinite energy, 
which everything is made of in some way. And that is the source of the force for good. And Buddhism did a wonderful thing in Indian history. And it took the term Vajra, which was in Vedic period, connected with the thunderbolt of the god Indra, very violent power unleashed against an enemy or something, like a blasting them with a thunderbolt. And this was turned into, in Buddhism, into the diamond of the force of love and compassion and wisdom, unbreakable by anything else. So the strong force of the universe is that love and wisdom, is the idea. And so reflect on this paradox that, you've, that your question very nicely brought up, about how sometimes it seems just nightmarish or hellish you know, the wars and starvings and whatever, homeless and poor, poverty and famine. It seems just awful, the world. And the paradox that, the possibility that there is a vision, that it is all made of blissful energy, and the awfulness comes from misunderstanding and actions and wrong actions based on that misunderstand those misunderstandings, misknowledge, ignorance. And sort of the idea of a seeming reality and then a sort of discovered reality by enlightened people, supposedly, but which we are even encouraged to doubt about. So I'm not saying meditate on believing that. I'm rather saying sort of meditate on what, what you are, on the possibility, sort of trying that out, like what would it be like if that was the de my default sense of what I am filled with and surrounded with and made of, as opposed to the default sense that I do have, either from theistic religions or from secularism, that it's all kind of like some hopeless business ending in nothing, or some business filled with the threats of hell, if I'm not a goody-goody or something, or none of the chosen or something like that, and which even if I am, I'm unhappy that so many people are not chosen, so it doesn't seem nice to me. So reflect on what I feel reality is around me and what Buddha claimed reality was. Parinirvana, thorough freedom from suffering, thorough freedom.
relaxation, the, the outcome of this kind of a meditating, of this kind of a theme, should be a kind of feeling of an inner point of relaxation, a feeling like sort of makes me think of Ray Charles' famous song of It's All Right. It's all right, you know, I can't remember the name of the, that's the name of the song. But I remember a video where there was a video of, I think it's the George Washington Bridge or some bridge shaking in an earthquake. <laughs> and then he's saying, it's all right, it's all right, you know. And um, kind of the paradox between the bridge being shaken apart by an earthquake and him saying, it's all right. So a kind of relaxation that no matter what happens, even if one dies, even if something happens, it's, it's somewhere at the deepest level, all right. And then noting one's points of fear and sort of habitual judgment about the dangers of this and this and that and the awful things and fears of sort of, and then the, the, the cosmic levels of those fears. Like there could be some terrible punishment awaiting that maybe we heard about when we were little kids somewhere. And some sort of like, you know, when you sort of think, you let yourself look into a deep thing of finding a diamond-like plane of goodness as the substance of the universe or something like that. The insubstantial substance of the universe. <clears throat> then one's fear is that it might not be and one's, one's habitual idea that the universe is a really dodgy scene should pop, come to the surface. You become aware of them, your mind veers off into them. So you work on that, basically. You work on those two on the, on the implications of those two attitudes. Okay? So, but ding, we don't have to go to the full length of time. So ding, <laughs> that's it. And a little bit of housekeeping. The next class, we're beginning to look at Pali Buddhism. And there are certain sutras, which if you want to get the book, you can get it on, from Amazon, and it's called The Long Discourses of the Buddha translated by Maurice Walsh, W-A-L-S-H-E. And I want you to read the Samana Pala Sutta, the first one especially, or the second one, called Samana Pala, the fruits of the homeless life. And you know, the first one is called the Brahma Jala Sutta, the death of Brahma. And uh, that's kind of long and a little bit complicated for you. You could look at that. And then you, maybe you can just pick and choose some other suttas in there. And those of you who don't want to buy that big book just for one bunch of assignments, there's a Dropbox, um, private Dropbox thing for members of the course, where you email in to Tenzin Sonam here at uh, Tibet House, and then you get a password to get into that Dropbox. And then there will be a scan of those suttas from that publication, which has to be in a locked way like that, just for members of the course, because of copy copyright issues. I can't just put it out on the, it's actually, it is a PDF that is widely around in the net, but I don't want to participate in uh, making it really open to the public. But just to you members of the course, there, uh, and you'll see the suttas in there. And I, I hope everyone who has come and who plans to continue in the course has given your email to Rebecca, I guess, is the one who is here now, so that we can inform you about this kind of thing. And anyone who is online, if their email is available to us, I presume that's so, or you couldn't get access to the online. So uh, we want to do this in an organized way. Those of you who are here tonight, but who couldn't come to a particular session and want to continue, could then do it from remotely or from online if you sort of connect it in this, in the, this and that way. Okay, any other housekeeping thing, Rebecca? There, there was one question from a, a, a streamer, and they just wanted to know if you could repeat these words in Tibetan again. What is that? They wrote in and they just wanted you to repeat that in Tibetan again. 
Could you ask me to repeat? Oh, yeah, profound, peaceful, clear light transparency is one thing, trouble free, and uncreated, not undream. Oh, this came in from the in, in online person. Oh, how great. Oh, good. Well, I can just comment on the profound or deep, sabshi, you know, peaceful. But those are both kind of adjectives. They're literally, it is deep peace. It wasn't adjectives, they were nouns. And then clear light is also a noun. But I objecting a little, when I, the reason I say transparency is that I object a little to the idea of clear light, although it's not wrong. It's very set as a translation for prabhaswara or asal in Tibetan. But it's prabhaswara in Sanskrit. But in a way, it's not really what we normally understand as light. Because the, in the subtle mind, when you go down to the deepest level of reality, which is clear light, you go through a moonlit and a sunlit space, which are brilliant lights. And then you go through a darklit space, which is completely dark. It's like bright black, but blackness as bright. It's so black it's bright. And then you come to this so-called clear light, which is really means transparency in the sense that it is beyond the duality of light and dark. It has elements of both light and dark in it. And it's actually, the analogy for it is a gray color, like the twilight color. So clear light, if the emphasis is on the light, it's misleading. If the emphasis is on the clear, it's OK. So I wanted to say, therefore, I tra tra the better translation for it is transparency. OK? But, the, but since clear light is so well known by people, I, I sometimes write clear light transparency as one thing, a cell. Then trouble free is fine. And then the final one is uh, dumaje, uncreated. Not undreamed, but uncreated. Okay. Deep, peace, transparency, trouble free, and uncreated. Sabshi, turtle. Sabshi Ursel Turtel Dumaje. That's what the, that's what he said. Dudzi Tavor Chuchi Gornye. Like an elixir of immortality is the reality I have discovered. I have experienced. That's what he said. Okay? Okay, Martha, thank you for the question. Okay? Good night, everybody. Thank you. Okay, take a break.